There's a myth going round town that when you get older you just sit down and start rocking. Just rocking. In a way that's true, if you know what I mean. Just take a look at the senior scene. Well, it's rocking. So, without further ado, welcome, Dr. Gaylord. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, so glad to uh, be here with y'all to talk about mindfulness uh, and stress management, the brain health. So, as you probably know from the lecture, the learning objectives are to gain a basic understanding about stress response in the body, to learn how stress impacts brain function and how mindfulness can reduce stress, as well as be introduced to some simple techniques of mindfulness. How many people here have already been practiced or ever practiced or been introduced to mindfulness? So, um, that's great. So this will be a review for some of you, and maybe I'll ask more about how you learn when we get to that place. So what is stress? It, it stress is the emotional and physiological reaction to any event that the organism finds emotionally and or physically challenging. So as you can see, this definition is show describing an interaction between the idea of stress being your reaction to an event. So it's not always the event itself that's stressful, it's the interaction between the individual and the event. So as we are sure are aware, life is full of stressful events. The uh, top ten stressful events as defined by the Holmes Ray Life Stress Scale, which I did a study on that, found that spouse's death is number one, and divorce, marriage, or separation, or jail term, death of a close relative, injury, illness, marriage, being fired from a job, marriage reconciliation, and retirement. These are all very high on the list of stressors. And sometimes, even when we ourselves don't have the stressor, having a person who's very close to us can be almost as stressful as the event itself. A stressors also can be positive, such as, as, as you notice, a marriage reconciliation, or getting married, or planning a big trip, for example, can be very stressful. But in addition to these top 10 stressors, there are what we call daily hassles, and those are probably much more common events, um, stressful events, that are probably occur on a daily basis to many of us. Misplacing or losing your keys, for example. How many people have had that happen? It's all the time. And uh, you might, I don't know how many of you have a tire. Uh, those are little things that help you find your keys. And then I don't know how many of you have lost your pile and you are having to look at that too. So it's um, very stressful just being a human being. Uh, concerns about money, uh, owing it to other people, not having enough, wanting to give more, too many responsibilities. Planning meals even can be stressful. Um, the need for home maintenance, you're having to wait in line for traffic, not getting enough sleep, and then, for example, not getting enough sleep leads to uh, a more stressful experience of your day. I'm sure you all have had the experience of just not having had enough sleep and everything seems just a little bit harder that day. That's a stressor and that adds up. Um, even concerns about your own perception of how do you look, you know, for example, or, or whether you're wearing clothes that are Occasion. They seem such a small, tiny stressors, but um, they can be, uh, again, they can add up. And different people experience these, and we're going to talk more about that, but different people experience these as either more or less stressful, depending on their personalities and the, the life um, events that they have had. 
So uh, in addition to these hassles, uh, we also have a kind of a background stress that seems in some days, uh, these days, to be a little worse than uh, usual. Um, mass shootings to weather, hurricanes, uh, you know, a tornado, for example, coming in our direction could be quite, could really add a huge amount of stress to your day. Um, and then just, again, even almost unconscious stress was about uh, feeling, uh, do you feel safe in your environment? Uh, you know, do you go to the store at midnight by yourself? No, probably not. Because that's, that's actually more stressful as well as being dangerous, maybe. Um, so we have um, you, our various responses to stress, a stressful event. Uh, and, there, and I'm sure you've already heard of the three major reactions to stress being flight, fight, or freeze. Um, and now I just thought I would give this example and have us kind of visualize ourselves being in stress. And, and I thought it was really appropriate since I got caught in traffic today on the way here. Um, imagine yourself right now, just close your eyes for a moment. Imagine yourself being stuck in traffic. Um, you're, you're on the way to an event and you don't want to be late. Suddenly, a car accident is ahead and your car is to stop. How does that make you feel? Oh. Anybody? Terrible. Powerless. Powerless, yes. Aggravated. Aggravated. Yeah. Well, let's see, that's probably a very good response to stress. <laughs> Um, what about physiologically? What happens in your body? Intense. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Your heart raises. Right? Yeah. Heart, your heart might raise. Yeah. Your, um, you might actually uh, perspire more, you know, if you're anxious. Or, or you, um, you might just have tense, like you said, throughout your whole body. Uh, but definitely not a good feeling to be stressed out. Uh, what happens according to the physiology of stress is that when we get into a flight, fight or flight mode, our physiology shifts very abruptly. The saliva flow decreases, for instance. Your eyes and your pupils dilate. The skin may uh, constrict chills or sweating may occur, your heart might be faster, you may breathe more quickly. Um, one thing that's interesting is that you're not hungry. Suddenly, um, you know, if we could bottle that, now that would be good, but um, <laughs> you just stop your, your whole digestive system. When you're really stressed out, you just grind to a halt. And um, we, our muscles may become tense and all of our body is in a mode that's geared towards survival. So as we all know, this is actually very helpful. To, it may have increased our ability to survive as a species over thousands and millions of years. And what we call that is sympathetic nervous system um, shift, which activates that flight or fight mode. And that allows us to run faster, uh, fight harder, and escape from the um, oppressor or the, uh, the aggressor. When we can overcome that stress, then we can shift back into what's called parasympathetic nervous system um, mode, which activates our relaxation response. And, and, and the parasympathetic system is an indicator that our body and mind are now saying, okay, you can relax, there's no danger, but we, now we can eat again, I'm, I'm hungry, or, you know, I'm sleepy, and I'm ready to um, enjoy life. So most of us would prefer to be in the state of parasympathetic state as much as possible. Most uh, mammals <laughs> discharge their stress when the threat is over, and then they settle down into their regular routine. But human beings um, are very complex, and we tend to hold on to stress, even when the danger has passed, which can lead us to be in a 
state of mind where we're not even actually present in the moment. We may be thinking about the past, worrying about the past, ruminating about our life situation, or worrying about the future, what might happen, what might happen to our loved ones, what might happen with our finances. We spend a huge amount of our time in the past or the future, in our minds, while our, ourselves, of course, we're in the present. There really is no way, of we, as we imagine, to be in either the past or the future. So it's interesting that we feel um, that the, sometimes the present moment is just a flicker, when actually it's extremely expansive and is basically all that is. So when we are uh, in chronic stress, which is what happens with human beings much more than with, uh, as I said, other mammals, then our stress overload can occur and produce very unhealthy responses. We'll talk more about this, but when we are in chronic stress, our level of stress hormones, cortisol, remains elevated, and our nervous system can remain on hyperarousal, or over time, we'll talk about, it can lead to hypoarousal. And this creates a very unhealthy chronic stress response we don't want to have. And actually, it can lead to many other unhealthy conditions. This um, graph here describes the uh, Dr. Hans Sele, what he called the general adaptation syndrome, where our stress response system first increases in response to prolonged stress. But after a while, we just basically exhaust our stress response. And we may become fatigued. Uh, we may not be able to sleep. We may have other um, imbalances that can cause many illnesses and conditions over time. Um, some people have used the term adrenal fatigue, for instance. Um, there are other ways of describing just the, the body cannot do it anymore. And there is, uh, sometimes it's almost unconscious, our, our reaction to stress. We may not even realize that we have kind of put ourselves in a chronic stress mode. These, uh, this list here shows some of the unhealthy reactions that occur when we are just stressed chronically. We may eat too much or too little and as a response to stress, for instance. You may either sleep too much or you may not be able to sleep at all. You may be very depressed or you may have anxiety on a chronic basis. You're, it may affect your heartbeat. You may have high blood pressure. And uh, you may be thinking, well, this is, these, are all, these are some physiological uh, conditions. And yes, stress is uh, often the perpetrator uh, of some of many of these conditions. Chronic inflammation in the body can uh, result and the immune system may uh, become dysfunctional or less functional, which means that you're more uh, likely to get a, uh, an infection and not be able to get rid of it as quickly. So um, weight gain, diabetes, heart disease, all these other conditions will be more likely to occur when we're chronically stressed. But this is about brain health, and I want to mention that the stress response is pretty obvious, but the stress response begins in the brain, and fortunately for us, it can, uh, our brains can help uh, overcome the stre our stress response, or our chronic stress response. So when someone experiences a stressful event in the brain, the amygdala, which is an area of the brain that contributes to emotional processing, sends out a distress signal to the hypothalamus. And the hypothalamus then activates the pituitary gland and the adrenal glands, and this is called the HPA axis, the hypopituitary adrenal axis. Uh, which is, you could almost call that the stress triangle where it happens. 
Once that is activated, then the adrenal medulla secretes uh, hormones such as adrenaline and nephrine and so forth, which prepare the body to fight. And then um, that causes what we were describing earlier, being the muscles tightening and uh, heartbeat uh, increasing. And also, uh, adrenal uh, cortex releases cortisol, which tries to maintain balance. And uh, cortisol, as we probably know, if you have chronically high cortisol or chronic uh, pressure to produce cortisol, that it will increase blood pressure and uh, it, it changes our whole metabolism. For example, it will uh, cause our um, fat and sugar to go to our cells, so we can have maybe more trouble with chronic weight gain and, uh, and all the other uh, exacerbations we mentioned earlier. So it can also, chronic stress can also damage brain structure and function. So um, imagine uh, that you're in a state where your foot is always on the gas pedal, always pushing, pushing. And in some cases, one foot is on the gas pedal and the other is on the brake. And uh, that's another um, um, way of thinking about chronic stress. So your body and mind are always grabbed up and on high alert. And that can lead to problems in the brain with um, memory, such as um, encoding of memories and retrieving of memories. Uh, it can also cause um, much more anger, and you, know, you can be uh, wrapped up with, with anger, reacting, and, um, irritability, um, and all these other uh, negative emotions will increase, and these can stay increased with chronic stress. So um, it creates what is sometimes called a fight or flight loop where you're decreasing your connectivity with other parts of the brain that can actually control the anger and other negative emotions. And they can actually heighten your sense of threat arousal and a bias, emotional bias towards events. So we want to turn off that response. And luckily, the uh, human beings being complex and having a uh, very high intelligence, as we all do, and our ability to reflect on our lives as we all can. We can, we have the ability to manage our stress. We can control a lot, large part of the stress response. Maybe we can't control the event, but we can control our own reaction or response to that event. Uh, the brain's neuroplasticity particular allows us to continually change the structure and function of the brain. So learning to manage stress can lead to greater mental, emotional, and physical well-being, even in the midst of stressful life events. There are numerous mind-body practices, including Tai Chi, Yoga, Qigong, Massage, Hypnosis, I've feedback and many therapies um, that can be helpful. Laughter, for example, is not uh, can be done as a therapy, but it's something we, we can all do. Um, having a sense of humor is one of the best ways to actually break that chronic stress response. But first, you have to see the humor, right? Sometimes we don't want to see the humor in a situation, but if we can. That is probably the cheapest and quickest way to make a shift uh, from the sympathetic to the parasympathetic system. How many of you have just uh, enjoyed just watching a television show, a sitcom or something, and just start laughing? Mm -hmm. if, if you could put a monitor on you, you would notice that your body has, your heart rate has probably decreased, your blood pressure has decreased, your, um, you're much more relaxed, and you may be hungry, you may want to go get some popcorn. So it's all good, right? It's all, you're all shifting towards parasympathetic. And um, what we teach, one of the, the special types of mind-body practices that we teach at UNC is mindfulness. And I'm going to talk a little about what is mindfulness, and I think, as I said, I saw that many of you 
are already familiar with mindfulness. Uh, but that is one of the many tools that we do have that is also very accessible to us. Once we've learned very simple te techniques, we can begin uh, to utilize them whenever we need to in order to shift our response to stress to a more, more positive, healthful response. So, this is just uh, some photos of people doing both uh, mindfulness and Tai Chi practice. How many of you have done Tai Chi or another mind-body practice like, like yoga? Very, very helpful. So, you know, if you're if you're inclined towards doing these practices, uh, you can choose whichever one you find most attractive and most uh, easy. But you know, if nothing else, just enjoy um, listen to something funny on the radio, TV, and that will help a lot. So let's talk about mindfulness. What is that? It's a uh, defined in the more you might say Western terms as a behavioral technique involving intentional self-regulation of attention to present moment experience. So being, uh, regulating yourself to be in the present rather than allowing yourself to be in a kind of drifting towards um, ruminating in the past or worrying about the future. And it's combined with release of various thoughts of the past and future as they occur. So it's not a state in which you have a void of thoughts, but it's a state in which when you do have a thought, you can just notice that and simply let the thought go. That doesn't mean that you're not having uh, thoughts in terms of uh, having a daily life in which you can have wonderful cognitive functioning. It actually probably means that we can function even better in terms of um, being uh, able to recognize and choose which responses we like to pursue and which we like to avoid. So the main elements of mindfulness are paying attention on purpose in the present moment without judgment. And the part about without judgment, which we will talk more about when we do the exercise of mindfulness, is that you might notice a thought, you will, uh, or emotion, or another event happens in your mind, but without labeling that as, as um, well, that's, you know, that, that was really, I shouldn't have thought about that, I shouldn't have that's a dumb thought, or oh, that's the most brilliant thought I ever had, whatever. You, you're just noticing it very simply as a thought, recognizing that it's a thought, and letting it go. So that's the non-judgmental aspect of mindfulness. So mindfulness training has been used increasingly as a therapeutic tool for both clinical care as well as self-care in the uh, United States. It seems particularly helpful for stress-related and emotionally-related conditions. And mindfulness training cultivates this non-evaluative state of present moment awareness. Mindfulness is often taught on one-on-one uh, -on -one, uh, with individuals. It can also be taught in groups. It's taught in more traditional contexts, such as a Buddhist meditation uh, programs, and it's also being taught very increasingly with mindfulness-based stress management <coughs> uh, programs. It can be taught alone or it can be incorporated into other therapies. Uh, one of the other therapies is often used is a mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, which won't be going into. Uh, but it just is a, it's used by psychologists who are trained and they add their, their, uh, their skill in therapy and bring in mindfulness, which can be very helpful to certain people. Um, or, and it can be taught, for example, um, with 
individuals who have specific illnesses by a therapist, and they may teach them one-on-one -on -one like that, as well as just people that want to just improve their health and well-being who don't have any particular problems at all. We paid our dues all those years and it's so nice to be switching gears it's a grand new century and it's the senior life the senior life the senior life for me